guys for coming to my talk about orchestrating multi-tenancy Kubernetes environments with Flux. My name is Priyanka Ravi. I am a developer experience engineer at Weaveworks. If you're, yeah, <laughs> I saw some laugh. So yeah, I like to pose my dogs and make them model Flux shirts. Um, they, <laughs> if you're not familiar with Weaveworks, we're the company that created Flux and also coined the term GitOps. Um, and we have a bunch of other tools as well such as a tool called Flagger, and then we have a lot of other things around the Flux ecosystem as well, um, such as our Weave GitOps UI, which is open source as well, and then um, the Terraform controller, which lets you do Terraform deployments, and the VS Code extension as well. There's a bunch of others, but yeah. And then we also have paid support and uh, um, other things around Flux. So I'm gonna start with what is GitOps and what is Flux, and then we'll go into multi-tenancy and um, before I get into that, I guess I'll share, like, yeah, I'll go back in a second. So along with being a developer experience engineer now at Weaveworks, I was actually um, a software engineer at State Farm before this, and I was on the team that stood up GitOps there. And one of the things we did was set up Flux multi-tenancy on our on-prem Kubernetes solution there. So that's my experience with this topic. Um, so what is GitOps? GitOps is an operating model for cloud native applications such as Kubernetes, but it's not limited to Kubernetes. Um, it's, if you're doing multi-cloud infrastructure like we were doing at State Farm, you can still you know, make it work for other um, platforms. But since this talk is about Kubernetes, we'll be focusing on that. And it also utilizes a version controlled system such as Git, like most commonly Git, as the single source of truth. But there's other things you can use, like OCI repositories um, and S3 buckets and stuff. So yeah. Um, and then it also enables continuous delivery through automated deployment, monitoring, and management by a version controlled system. So you basically manage your infrastructure and applications declaratively, which brings us into the GitOps principles. So the, these principles were actually set by talking to end users and people in the industry. Um, yeah, y'all can come in, it's all good. Um, we just started. And um, so the, they're created by the um, GitOps working group and you can um, find out more about that at opengitops.dev. We welcome people to join us at our meetings and stuff like that. Um, please, please come chat with us about GitOps. So uh, the first one is that a system managed by GitOps must have its desired state expressed declaratively. So everything is written in code, it's reusable, there's an audit trail, things like that. Um, desired state is stored in a way that enforces immutability, versioning, and retains a complete version history. So in this way, there's no sneaking and changes. Everything's, you know, in, in a, there's a trail. Um, software agents automatically pull the desired state declarations from the source, and they also continuously observe um, actual system state and attempt to apply the desired state. So this is where something like Flux comes in and um, actually pulls your changes in. And if you're not, you know, fulfilling all these requirements, don't feel like you can't get started with GitOps because we didn't have all these set yet, <laughs> and you know, it's like a process, but this is kind of like the end goal, like this is what you wanna have with GitOps. All right, so why? Why should you care? Um, there's a lot of reasons, like there's a lot of benefits that come with GitOps. So individuals, like people that use it, experience many things such as um, stronger security guarantees. So because of the way that GitOps treats everything as code, it also creates a direct impact on security. So for example, if all configuration and security policy are treated as code, then everything can be held in version control and everything, every change that's made is reviewed, input, and it's all automated. There's no manual processes, which means you're probably less likely to be at work on a weekend. If anyone's done Friday deployments, they get it. Um, and also there's like, so with that comes increased developer and operational productivity, makes the developer experience better. You can focus on things that you really care about. And there's more stability, higher reliability, consistency, and standardization as well. So now let's talk about Flux. Flux is a Git-centric package manager for your applications, but like I mentioned earlier, Git isn't the only source that you can use. 
Um, and it provides a set of continuous and progressive delivery solutions for Kubernetes. So it's a natural, it was created with Kubernetes like entirely in mind. So it's a very natural extension of Kubernetes. And at the core, it basically just continuously monitors your version control system or your source, S3 bucket, whatever. And it applies the desired state that's been declaratively expressed there. And the nice part of this is that it actually runs on a um, schedule. It reconciles, the term is reconciles, on a schedule. And you don't have to worry about configuration drift because if something gets out of sync or something, then it'll actually set it back, which is nice. And it also really reduces developer burden because like I mentioned earlier, it removes the need for manual deployment processes as well. Also, the CLI, the Flux CLI, is a really easy way to interact with Flux. So you can bootstrap the cluster, which is to get it set up really fast. And you can also access um, the custom resources that make up the API. So, Flux is GitOps for apps and infrastructure, like I mentioned. The idea is you just push to Git, and Flux does everything else. It is declarative, automated, and auditable. Um, Flux and Flagger, so I mentioned Flagger earlier. Using Flagger, you can actually deploy apps with Canary, feature flags, and AV rollouts as well. Flux can also manage any Kubernetes resource. Infrastructure and workload dependency management is built in. Flux can even push back to Git for you with automated container image updates to Git, so like image scanning and patching. You can describe the entire desired state of your system in Git, and this includes apps, configurations, dashboards, um, monitoring, and everything else. So you use YAML to enforce conformance to the declared system. Um, you don't need to run kube control because all changes are synced automatically. And everything is controlled through pull requests, so your Git history provides a sequence of transactions allowing you to recover state from any snapshot as well. It's also designed with security in mind, and so the whole pull versus push argument, right? Um, so there's the least amount of privileges in this case. It ad adheres to Kubernetes security policies, and there's also a tight integration with security tools and best practices. You can read more about that in our docs um, under security considerations. Also, we say that it's multi-cluster, multi-tenancy, and we like to say multi-everything, um, which we're gonna talk about. <laughs> and Flux can use one Kubernetes cluster to manage apps in either the same or in other clusters, spin up additional clusters themselves, and manage clusters including life cycles and fleets. And it works with any Kubernetes and all common tooling that you're probably already using. Um, Flux works with your Git providers, such as GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket. Like I mentioned earlier, you can even use S3 buckets as a source. All major container registries, OCI registries, um, and CI workflow providers. There's also support for customized Helm, um, Harbor, custom webhooks. You can um, set up notifications on Slack and other chat systems as well. Um, RBAC and different policy validation, policy driven validation like OPA, Kyverno, um, admission controllers, whatever. And um, it is created with Kubernetes controllers, so it's very modular and you can tailor it to your needs. Um, and also, dashboards love Flux, we say that, because it's really easy to set up, like whatever you're using your Flux situation on, it's really easy to set up um, dashboards and visualize your situation. There's also a lot of offerings out there for such a thing as well. Um, and so the benefits of Flux is that it reduces developer burden. It also removes the cube control problem, like I mentioned a second ago, where you don't have to worry about cube control versions in order to interact with your cluster. And um, it's also really extensible, so it's versatile. It, I mentioned the, that it's Kubernetes controller, so it's like a microservice architecture. You can tailor your experience with Flux. You can kind of pick and choose what you want to use in order to make your experience the best that it can be. Yeah, and, it's, and like I said, it um, was designed for Kubernetes and it comes with um, out-of-the-box support for Customize and Helm. So, um, if you're not familiar with the Kubernetes controller, they handle the life cycle of objects in Kubernetes. So like what should be done when an object is created, updated, deleted, et cetera. And so this is kind of like the breakdown of our little controllers. So um, the source controller um, fetches resources from whatever your source is. So 
bucket, um, S3 bucket, whatever, and it stores them as artifacts. So it just grabs them and puts them, um, grabs them. And <laughs> the customized controller goes in and um, applies those manifests. And the reason it's called the customized controller is because it's using customize. So if you have a customization.yaml already there that says like, these are the files that I want to apply, overlays, whatever, it'll apply those. If there's not a customization.yaml specified in the path that you tell it to apply from, it'll actually um, recursively search the folders from that path and it'll um, pull all the YAMLs that it finds and it kind of creates its own customization.yaml on its side and then applies it. Um, and then the Helm controller manages deployments of Helm charts and it's actually using the true Helm lifecycle. So if you use the Helm, like if you do a Helm release, you can actually interact with the Helm charts using the Helm API like you normally would if you did like a Helm install. So you can still like list things, you can use the API to interact. Um, and then the notification controller does notification dispatch. It handles inbound and outbound events. And so the, the like it's, it can do like Slack notifications or like whatever you want to notify to. So let's say you do a, um, you make a change and you push and you want to be notified like, hey, a new change was just pushed and like it, it went in, like Flux actually picked it up and deployed it. Or like if something gets out of sync, you can be notified. But another cool thing that the notification con controller can do that maybe some people aren't taking advantage of is you can set it up to listen for webhooks. So let's say I push to Git and I don't want to wait, I don't know if my sync interval is like 10 minutes, I don't want to wait possibly 10 minutes for my change to be picked up. I can actually set up the webhook to um, notify the notification controller, which then tells the source controller to go pull the change in. So um, yeah. Uh, and then the image controllers work together to um, update a Git repository when a new container image is available. So the image reflector controller um, scans image repositories and reflects the image metadata into Kubernetes resources. And then the um, image automation controller updates YAML files based on the latest images scanned and commits the changes to a given Git repository. Okay, so now let's talk about multi-tenancy. Um, obviously, I'm sure, I'm sure most of you know that there's different forms of multi-tenancy. Um, there's hard multi-tenancy, which is, you know, each tenant has their own cluster. And then there's soft multi-tenancy, which is where a cluster is shared across many different tenants. And my own experience, um, like working at State Farm and like what we did is actually soft multi-tenancy. So that's what I'm going to be focusing on. Um, and with soft multi-tenancy, the key here is that tenants need to be isolated. You don't want people being able to mess with other people's namespaces or whatever's in their, like their deployments, their applications. So, all right. So um, Flux defers to Kubernetes native RBAC to specify which operations are authorized when processing its custom resources. So by default, operations um, are constrained by the service account that the controllers run under, and it has the cluster admin role bound to it. So this works for a model in which all users are trusted. It's not always the case, obviously, that's usually not. Um, since tenants control Flux via its API objects, so um, RBAC rules need to be attached to Flux API objects. Um, to give users control, uh, in a multi-tenant deployment, each tenant needs to be restricted in the operations that can be done on their behalf. So um, to give users control of the authorization, the Flux controllers can actually impersonate um, or assume the identity of a service account mentioned in the apply specification. So there's a field that you can set um, in the customization object or in like a Helm release object if you're doing Helm um, for both accessing resources and applying configuration. So this lets a user constrain the operations performed by the um, Flux controllers via RBAC. So the, in the tenancy model, there are two types of users. There's platform admins and tenants. Um, so besides installing Flux, all the other applications such as like deploying applications, configuring ingress, policies, et cetera, um, do not require users to have direct access to the Kubernetes API. So Flux acts as a proxy um, between users and the Kubernetes API. So using it uses Git and OCI as the source of truth for the cluster desired state. 
Um, so the platform admins um, would have unrestricted access to Kubernetes API. They're the ones that are responsible for installing Flux and granting Flux access to the sources, such as like Git, Helm, OCI repositories. Um, and th that makes up the cluster's control de plane desired state. The um, repositories owned by the platform admins are reconciled on the clusters via Git Flux under the cluster admin Kubernetes cluster role. So um, some examples of like operations performed by platform admins would be bootstrapping, like I mentioned, Flux onto the clusters, extend the, um, extending the Kubernetes API with custom resource definitions and validation webhooks, um, configuring various controllers for ingress, storage, logging, monitoring, whatever. Um, they set up namespaces for the tenants um, and define their level of access with the Kubernetes RBAC. They're basically the ones that are like onboarding tenants and registering their Git repositories with Flux. They're doing all of that. Um, and then the tenants have restricted access to the clusters according to the Kubernetes RBAC that's set by the platform admins. The um, repositories owned by tenants are reconciled on the clusters by Flux and under the Kubernetes accounts assigned by the platform admins. So they would be doing things like registering their sources with Flux, their workloads, um, deploying their workloads onto their namespaces, and um, setting up webhooks for alerting for the release pipelines, configuring the release pipelines and stuff like that. And so um, my experience like before was more on the platform admin side. It was kind of interesting. We had like a, like a separate GitOps team. So we were kind of in like a, a middle state between the platform admins and the tenants. And um, it's, I guess, this, yeah, this is probably a good place to mention it, but the, the um, thing was like before we started applying multi-tenancy with Flux, nothing was declarative. If you wanted to go look at how the cluster, clusters were set up, it was all done manually or through API calls. There was no way of knowing like what was on those clusters, any, any like um, custom resources, like no CRDs, like you couldn't see it unless you went and like actually did API calls. So once we started um, adding Flux multi-tenancy, it became a lot clearer to be able to see like what's on this actual cluster. You can see like what namespaces are on there. You don't have to do like um, calls, you can just go look. Anyone can go look at the repository, right? So, all right, so, um, yeah, so like I mentioned like earlier, it's very important to make sure that there's tenant isolation in this situation. You wanna make sure that nobody can mess with anyone else's deployments or anything like that. So um, a platform admin can lock down Flux on multi-tenant clusters during Bootstrap with the following practices. So I mentioned Bootstrap earlier. It's the easiest way to get set up with Flux initially. Um, it's a simple command to run and then you can, it basically, if you, you point it to a repository and if the repository doesn't already exist, it uses your token to create the repository and then push the files that Flux needs up to it and then it sets itself up to listen to itself. And so that command's actually idempotent because you can update, upgrade the Flux CLI version later and then rerun the bootstrap command and it'll update all the files to the latest version. If the repository already exists, and even if the Flux system, um, Flux system folder already exists, it'll just bootstrap into what's already there and update, update the files if needed based on the version. So um, with the above configuration, Flux will deny cross namespace access to Flux custom resources. So it ensures that a tenant can't use another tenant's sources or subscribe to their events. And that's with the um, dash dash no cross namespaces refs equals true flag that's on this patch. And it also denies access to customized remote bases, which ensures that all resources refer to local files, meaning only the flux sources can affect the cluster state. And then um, also all customizations and Helm releases, which don't have spec.service account name specified, will use the default account from the tenant's namespace. So tenants have to specify a service account in their Flux resources to be able to um, deploy workloads in their namespaces as the default account has no permissions. Uh, the Flux system customization is set to reconcile under a service account with cluster admin role. 
um, which allows platform admins to configure cluster-wide resources and provision the tenant's namespace, um, resource accounts, and RBAC. So by default, Flux RBAC um, grants Kubernetes built-in view, edit, and admin role access to Flux custom resources. Um, this allows tenants to manage their own, to manage Flux resources in their own namespaces using a service account with a role binding to admin. So if you wish to disable the RBAC aggregation, you can remove the Flux view and Flux edit cluster roles with um, this, this patch as well. All right, so I'm gonna switch back to mirror. And get rid of this and then go back here. <laughs> okay. All right, so these are some good resources, but I wanted to show this because also this repository here is like an incredible resource. Um, it's how, like when we were first trying to learn multi-tenancy with Flux, we definitely relied on this and we just used it, like we followed all the steps in here. So this repository is still maintained, so it's like up to date. Um, it's a really great example if you wanna just like get started with using like if you want to like set up a kind cluster or something and just try it out, whatever your cluster is. Um, and so if you go in here, oh no, it's doing the thing it was earlier. It's not scrolling. <laughs> it's lagging, sorry y'all. Okay, dang. It's gonna take a second to scroll, sorry. So it says a lot of the same stuff I've already talked about, but um, I just want to scroll down here to show y'all like how to you know get started with it. <sighs> Sorry. So the first step is to bootstrap. Um, and this, if you're bootstrapping with this, like with um, a repo that's like this, it already has like the Flux system folder. This really doesn't want to move. All right. So <laughs> you're bootstrapping with the like existing thing and there's a Flux system folder. And um, so like I said, it uses your, um, your Git token to have access to edit the, the files. So this is the bootstrap command right here. And um, as you can see, there's, you know, like a um, owner, which is like your, your wherever you're trying to um, clone to, and then your repository, and then the branch personal. And then this path is like what's important because that's um, where you're telling it to go like um, set those files. And then, um, sorry, it's so slow. It's just so laggy. I should have restarted my computer. Uh, okay, so if you go through this on your own, I'm really sorry, y'all. There's a bunch of commands in here where like, it, it helps you kind of like learn also if you're new to Flux, the interactions with Flux. So like th this command right here is how you would like check your, like what customizations you already have set up. And so remember, those are the ones that are actually applying your files. This is like a command to see like what sources you have that are pointing to Git specifically in this case. And then um, so on and so forth. So like Helm command, right? Helm releases. <sighs> I wanna get to the onboard new tenants part. <laughs> it just won't scroll. Okay, give it a, okay, there. <laughs> so the way, no, now you're scrolling too much. Um, okay, so the way that you, sorry y'all, the way that you create a new tenant is with this, this command right here. So this flux create tenant um, dev team with namespace apps. So that, that's telling it to create this tenant that's called dev team. Oh my gosh, now it's just moving. <laughs> and the, this team that's called dev team will have um, access to this, this um, namespace called apps. And if you actually give it more dash dash with namespaces, it'll create multiple namespaces that this team then has access to. So, um, and then this export command, you can run this command without the export, but what that'll do is it'll just actually create the tenant and then you won't be truly doing GitOps, right? Because it's just there and it's not been pushed to Git. So if you do this export command, you can put it in this location, then push it to Git, which is what this is saying to do. Create a source, which is how you tell it, um, go listen to this, um, at this URL, go you know, pull whatever's there. And then um, this is telling, the customization is saying, hey, within that repo that the source is listening to, only, um, 
uh, apply what's in this case everything because it's dot slash but you could specify like you know whatever path you want within that repo um, and then you push it and um, so let me just show you real quick what that command creates oh my goodness it's everything okay well so <laughs> It creates this um, namespace. So this is, like I said, in this case, there's only one namespace that it's creating. And um, I ran this command saying team one, I think, and I said team one namespace. So this label is to say that everything's tied to this team one tenant. And then um, it's also creating the role binding over the, well, sorry, I need to scroll up. No, scrolled. Yeah, sorry. So this is the service account that it creates the um, team one service account, and then it, down there was the role binding that gives it the accesses it needs to, um, to the service account. Okay, and then, um, yeah, with the lagging, <laughs> that's, that's all I, can, I think I can show on that repo. But I do recommend going and testing that repo out for yourself. It's really simple to use, and like it's quick and easy to get started using multi-tenancy really quickly. Um, if you want to reach me and ask me any questions um, further or chat about Flux, chat about multi-tenancy, um, these are the places you can reach me. Um, I'm also in the CNCF Slack, as well as we have a um, channel in the CNCF Slack, just hashtag Flux, where you can reach us if you have any questions about Flux as well. And then that QR code, if you scan it, will take you to um, all of our upcoming events. So we have a few talks actually at KubeCon coming up as well. And then um, also, please come visit us at the Project Pavilion booth. We will be there all day, every day probably, other than our talks. And so um, we'd love to chat with you guys and hear your experiences or give you help or anything like that that you need. So, or just chat. We're, we're happy to chat. So um, that is everything I got. Thank you guys. Are there any questions? I know I'm kind of, I'm sorry. I, I, went, uh, I went to like almost the end of my time. I think we have two minutes. Sorry, y'all. <laughs>